Hello everyone, Mollusk here. And today I want to talk to you about an idea I've had. An idea I'm calling the goat in the shell. Essentially what it boils down to is giving a bray shaman the skin of man. And no, I don't think I'm a genius. No, I don't think I'm the first person to have had this idea. It's what the magic item is solely built for. And it's been around since the start of 7th edition, I believe. However, I really love the concept. And I think it'll be a ton of fun to try to make it work. So I'm not under any illusions, and I know this is not going to be a quote-unquote competitive idea. Anybody who plays Warhammer should know that sending your expensive wizard, or rather deploying him, right next to the enemy army on turn one is a bad idea. But the fun is trying to get this borderline retarded item to work. So I just wanted just to discuss some ideas for future games. I'd be really interested in any ideas you guys have, but as you probably clicked on this video by accident, I'm not really expecting anyone to <sighs> still, still be watching even this far into the video. So before we get cracking on the meat of this video, I'm going to indulge myself a little and introduce the subjects of our discussion. First up, Bray Shaman, Speakers of the Darkling Council. The shamans of the beastmen race are vile, are vile to behold, their filthy bodies covered in matted fur into which all manner of crude fetishes and grim charms are woven. Their twisted features are often covered in their ragged hood, and they bear heavy braystaffs as both brutal weapons and the symbol of their position in the war herd. Bray shamans occupy a unique niche in the brutal and bitter world of the beastmen. They have no need to defend themselves from other members of their tribe, for none would dare assault them. Not even the mightiest beast lord would harm a Bray Shaman, for they speak the will of the dark gods, and those that defy the gods pay the highest price of all. Yeah, I hear religion can be expensive. Bray Shamans are born into magic, and wield it with instinctive ease. A palpable miasma of fell sorcery surrounds them, and when their wrath is roused, reality itself dis is distorted and maimed. Tree roots twist and writhe at their pasking. The undergrowth boils with unholy life, and repugnant parasites scurry at their feet. It is said that the Bray Shamans can take the form of the beasts of the wildwood, the better to spy upon mankind. Countless are the tales of death and war presaged by visitations of evil-eyed crows, owls, or foxes. Many superstitions regarding such beasts grip the hearts of men, particularly in the most far-flung townships and military outposts. As the beast lords are the embodiment of their race's hatred for man, so the Bray Shamans embody the loathing of his gods. To blaspheme the dire deities of man is to do ultimate honour to chaos, and the Bray Shamans enact such defilement as the greatest of their rituals. The most blessed of all are those who have counselled their chieftains to wage unending war upon the Empire, and in doing so have burned to the ground the temples of the gods of man. To the Bray Shamans, the ultimate act of worship is to slay man's priests upon their own altars, to defecate upon their holy ground and trample their sacred artifacts beneath the cloven feet of the war herd. Once the war herds are gathered into mighty Bray herds, the Bray Shaman will lead the beastmen in a frenzied ritual celebration their discordant bellowing audible for many miles around. They invoke the power of the dark gods and infuse the assembled herds with bestial vigour. Blood sacrifices are made and the gizzards and hearts of captives are offered to the skies as the beastmen thrash and convulse around the herdstone. All manner of unspeakable excesses are committed before the ritual reaches its climax and the horde explodes out of the forests to ravage the land of the old world. When the beastmen go to war, the Bray Shamans wield their power to wreak terrible devastation upon the foe. Their coruscating magic, transforming soldiers into hideous new forms, summoning the creatures of the forest, both large and small, to bite and rend, or drive the enemy mount, driving enemy mounts to buck their riders to the ground, to gore and trample their masters. A Bray Shaman is a wizard. He may use spells from one of the following laws. The law of the world, the law of death, the law of shadow, or the law of beasts. So what is the skin of man? 
The Skin of Man is a 15 point magical item that it can only be used by a Bray Shaman. Whether this includes a great Bray Shaman seems to be a little bit, little bit um, of a matter of debate. But since both are included under Bray Shamans in the army section, I interpret this to mean that they can use the item. The description of the item reads, The wearer of the flayed, sigil-encrusted skin of man is under a glamour that makes him appear little more than a particularly ugly peasant. When the skin is cast aside, the awful truth is revealed. The bearer of the skin of man has the scout ability. Build 1 for Hermit. This is basically the cheapest chips option. What we have is a level 2 Bray Shaman with the Law of Shadow and the Skin of Man and the Talisman of Endurance to give him a 5 plus ward save and the Shadow Hide which increases the penalty to shoot imposed by soft and hard cover by 1. This costs 160 points. If we were just to take the Skin of Man then he would cost 125 points. We're paying the extra 35 points for those extra items for two reasons. One, to help him survive the first turn if you don't go first. Two, in the hope that if you do survive turn one, he might survive long enough to get more than one unit to shoot and or charge at him. But we'll go on, on into the role of, the, uh, of this shaman a little bit later. I like this guy because he's fast with a movement of 10. He's infantry on foot, so he's manoeuvrable, can hide in buildings, and get into small gaps. And, importantly, relatively cheap, because this guy's going to die. Next up, build 2, the Wandering Salesman. Level 2, skin of man, 5 up ward, tusk or chariot. 235 points. So this is getting a little bit pricey already, but who needs that second level 4 shaman? The idea with this build is that it's now more of a threat and therefore more of a target. A shaman mounted on a chariot has a split profile. So we're basically paying for a bit of a shield where the Bray Shaman will get hit one third of the time and the chariot can take a certain amount of punishment. So the skin of man allows the whole model to scout which perhaps I should have said earlier, allows the model to deploy out anywhere outside of 12 inches of any enemy unit. So on top of the magical attack, which we're essentially taking this shaman for, we also have the potential for a first turn charge, a comfortable one, against chaff, a bunker, or perhaps a, even a uh, bit of character assassination if you're feeling ballsy. I haven't tried this and I'm really looking forward to doing it because I really like the flavour of this uh, this build. I think it's uh, <laughs> it looks like a lot of fun but it's going to be massively over costed for what it can do. The uh, 235 points will get you 30 strong horde of gore with full command. Build 3. Travelling Salesman on steroids. Level 2 Shaman, Skin of Man, 5 up ward, Razor Gore Chariot. 300 eye-watering points. What this is giving us over the Tusk or Chariot is an extra point of toughness, an extra wound, and more confidence in the idea that if we charge we're gonna kill that chaff or that bunker or potentially that character. Let's not kid ourselves, this is still a Beastman Chariot and killing what you hit is therefore not guaranteed. Personally, this is my least favourite of the three because I see this model's role more as a decoy and a spell platform than as a uh, combat unit. But after I get sick of failing with the other two builds, then I'm not sure to give this one a go. So, the goat in the shell. What's its job? First and foremost, it's to get a first turn magical attack off at the enemy. Preferably, this should be a very nasty spell against something very valuable that your opponent has. Its second role is to be bait. If you can draw some war machine fire, or you know even archer fire away from your ranks for a turn, great. 
Maybe some units will even break off to charge it. Even better. Given the nature of the spell you're likely to be trying to cast, uh, you'll probably pull out of the spell scroll. And maybe that's the best you can really hope for in the <laughs> sometimes. But still, it's causing the opponent to sacrifice something early on that will allow you to be stronger in the later game. Third is the idea that potentially you could charge a war machine, if, particularly if you've got the chariots or a mage bunker, or somehow hit a uh, character if they're in a particular unit that you can somehow get the charge on, or take down some chaff. This is probably more of a cherry on the cake role than anything else. So really, if we're going to be honest, the goat in the shell is a fun, expensive, unreliable throwaway unit. And that's what beastmen really need. Wasted points. But I want to do this, so perhaps the idea should be to build an army around him. And this is what I'm trying to do here. So I've got a level 2 beta shaman. This guy's job is to take over when the goat in the shell dies. Which he's going to. And I've given him the power stone. This is important. The whole idea here is to dominate the magic phase. This item is one use only and allows you to add two extra power dice to one spell that you want to cast. This is key if you get a crappy magic phase. And probably actually works best in the cane rules. So whether you're using it on the first turn to support the uh, goat in the shells spell, or you're waiting for the Goat in the Shell to lure out the, the spell scroll and then going to be using the Power Stone to power the spell in later games with your Beta Shaman, it's pretty key to the strategy. Next up we've got the two level 1s, one with a Herd Stone and one with the Dispel Scroll, uh, they tend to come in useful I guess. And the idea again is to stand them around the Herd Stone first turn so that if you get a died roll on the Winds of Magic, you've got the extra three power dice, you've got all the Shamans giving you the potential for a channel also, and this is all built towards increasing the chances of getting that first turn hopefully devastating spell off, and then continuing the magic threat in subsequent turns. You could probably wiggle in a uh, power scroll here, but this is expensive enough. You're spending what, 400 and you know, 450 to 500 points on on just your ma your magicians. Uh, not to speak of your warriors or your battle sander bearer or, or whatever you know the other points you need to spend the rest of the army. So, trying to keep it as cheap as possible here. So we've got our shaman and we've got the power to back him up. What are we going to do with him? The Law of Shadow jumps out immediately. It's got just the tools we need to wreak havoc and some good range. Some might argue that because it's got such good range you don't need to be sending your shaman in so close to the enemy to start with. And they're almost certainly right. But we're going to do this anyway. So first up, the Miasma spell. I think this is the one you can guarantee of getting. Uh, you can use it to lower the ballistic skill of some shooty unit, uh, help your guys get in, help the rest of your army move up in you know, relatively more safety. But the initiative lowering ability is the one we're looking at here. The ability to lower the initiative by D3 stacks really nicely with the Pit of Shades. And this is what we're looking at. Plonk this on the enemy's most expensive heavy infantry or monsters, and he's going to be hoping he's got a dispel scroll. Or she. If you're feeling lucky, you could go for the bigger version of any of these spells, I guess. Uh, but I think these do the job and are more reliable. Just think for a second about the cane rules and being able to chain cast that pit of shades. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Another potentially useful tool is the Pendulum spell. So it's got a potentially very good range, high strength, and does D3 wounds. Again, if 
you're looking at a gun line with, say, a couple of cannons, organ guns, etc., in a row, sending that through all of them at once is going to ruin someone's day, and it won't be the beastmen's. This might also be worth going for if you're fighting elves. And so Pit of Shades, or initiative test-based stuff, probably isn't going to do that well. Uh, perhaps you can line up and try to take out some characters, maybe a wizard or so, with this one. But if you want to beat elves, why are you playing beastmen? The next law we could possibly choose is Law of Death. Not quite as good a shadow in my opinion for this, but it could do in a pinch. And I guess this would be mostly against characters, uh, for character sniping or, or taking out monsters, which beastmen don't typically excel at, so it could fill a hole, uh, fill a weakness here. Uh, so you, you could go for chaining Doom and Darkness and Spirit Leech together. But I think the, the spells you want to try to go for are the Fate of Buna, which is pretty nasty for characters, or Purple Sun, which is pretty much the same as Pit of Shades, but could be pretty hilarious to have rolling around in your uh, opponent's lines from turn one. I guess the ideal is to get a big magic phase, and we're all about trying to get the big magic phase here. Double dosing Miasma from both your Shadow Wizards, and then going for a pit of shades. <laughs> yeah, the goat dreams on. So that's my idea. I'm going to be trying it out as soon as I've got the models to do it. And it's going to go so badly wrong, it's going to be hilarious. Thanks for watching.